All right. Welcome, folks. Welcome back to the stream. How you doing? My name's Agent Ultra, and I'm here to learn about wave function collapse. It's a procedural generation algorithm used for generating textures and stuff. People make it also use it for generating poetry, whole worlds, and video games, things like that. Uh, on this stream, I mainly do stuff in Haskell. So if you're new to Haskell, welcome. Hi, if you're new to the stream, thanks for tuning in. And uh, yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna get started here. So I'm gonna pull up my editor, jump right back in. So for the last few weeks, we've been working on the pre-processing step of it. Um, so taking an input image and just generating some setup data we need to get the core of the algorithm going. And uh, we pretty much finished all the little pieces of that. I think we might need to want to tie it together into like kind of like a top level function, but um, yeah. I think we're going to be able to get into the core of the algorithm this week, maybe. Probably. Alright, so basically the idea is that our user is going to take whatever input data bitmap they have, whatever pixel data format it has, and they're going to create a, a texture with it. So our texture is just a wrapper around that array of, of whatever value it is. We don't really know how the pixel data is stored. Is it a you know, word aid or, or floats or whatever? Who knows? We don't really need to know all that much for the algorithm, it seems. So they create the texture, and out of the texture, we generate a bunch of patterns. Patterns are like, like little subsections of the input texture. And uh, they... We, we wrap around, we treat the texture as like a toroid, and we wrap around, and we cover all of the overlapping patterns by taking that sub -size, that subtexture kind of size there and moving it over one pixel at a time, taking a new stamp, creating a new pattern with that, moving it over one pixel at a time, taking a new pattern with that, so on and so forth, all the way around. So we get a bunch of overlapping patterns. And for a, like a 10 by like a 10 by 10 input texture, the, the input textures are pretty small. Uh, with these patterns, we say like a three by three pattern, we should get about a hundred patterns out of that. And then uh, there's the op opportunity there to also do like some rotations and symmetries with the patterns in order to generate interesting new textures. But for the most part, we're just we're just really focusing on the patterns here and getting those. Okay, so that's the algorithm there to generate pattern all the patterns out of the texture. And uh, from that, we can bring up a new browser window. No, don't want that. Uh, patterns, right? Generate all those. And then we need a couple little helper functions, like overlapping. And we need to know if a pattern overlaps with another. There's our little symmetry thing, which we can use if we want to tie things together. I don't know, function there. We also need to create a frequency hint map. So the frequency hint map basically allows us to know how many times in the input set a particular pattern shows up. So that's what this does. And then we uh, generate the adjacency rules. So wave function collapse is basically like a forward propagation solving algorithm. We'll think like Sudoku. We start with an input grid. And there's a lot of possibilities in each cell of the input grid of like values that we could put there. In the case of Sudoku, it's going to be a bunch of numbers from one to nine. And by picking a number for a cell, we collapse it down and we propagate out that choice. So we eliminate that possibility, the possibility of say we pick three, right? So all the neighboring cells in that kind of corner of the grid, we eliminate three from all of those, and then we eliminate three in all the row that we chose that we chose for the cell in, and then all the column, all the threes in the column. We remove the possibility of three from all of those. All right, so we propagate those out, and then um, eventually we should end up with a solved Sudoku grid, or at least in our case, a finished texture. So those adjacency rules are generated from our input data set. Um, they just are, it's based on the overlapping of the tiles. All right, so uh, our overlap function from earlier, if the pattern A overlaps with pattern B, then we allow it in our input 
our adjacency map and we say yep that can be those two tiles can be overlapping and this map just lets us to just let has a quick way of us just doing that kind of pre-checking all of those so when we're running the algorithm proper it's just a index lookup cool uh last thing we needed to generate was just the color map so because of the way the algorithm works we're actually only going to be able, when we generate the output texture we only need to pick the top left corner of our pattern in order to uh, fill in the pixel on the output map that we're gonna, we're gonna generate and uh yeah and once we have the color map that's that's pretty much it so uh we're gonna get working on there's gonna be like three main components to the overall core of the algorithm kind of a high level sketch is that while we have for some uh, output output grid initialized output for some in initialized output grid um while there are empty uh while there are uncollapsed cells we're going to choose a cell uh with the lowest entropy Now once we've chosen that cell, we collapse it. That means taking, picking uh, a tile from our pattern from the uh, possible patterns. Then we got to propagate that choice. or across the wave and you might hear sounds cooler and that's kind of where the name of the function gets its or the way the name of the algorithm that's where that's where this algorithm gets its name from i should say um the wave function collapse right the the wave is the grid of cells right and this propagation step it right, takes your function and propagates out the results of that function across the wave, right? Collapsing it down to a single, single value or a single grid of picked tiles. Now there are some caveats to this that I think we'll encounter perhaps later. And we might want to figure out how, I haven't really figured out which way I want to solve it yet. Um, there's no, there's no one right way to do it, but as you can imagine in Sudoku, picking a particular number, if you had a completely empty grid, right, with no pre-picked numbers, like you pre-collapsed cells, like you do you normally in the, in the newspaper version of the puzzle, right? Um, you can imagine if a completely empty one, you started with that and you just picked, say, five for one number, just start going from there. And then you propagate out, you eliminate all the fives, and then you pick another one, and you eliminate, you pick a value for the next cell, and then eliminate and propagate out all of that. Um, that you could come to a point where you get a con what's called a contradiction. Contradiction is when you pick a cell that has no possible patterns. To collapse to. And so the, through the propagation step, all the possibilities for this cell have been eliminated already. When you go to look at it and, you, and you're like, oh, uh, I can't collapse it to anything. It's got the empty list. It can't possibly be any other tile. This has already been eliminated. In that case, there's a bunch, there's some different ways you can handle it. You can either like some algorithms, maybe we'll take this approach the easy way out. Is to just start over, make some different choices, and uh, try again. You know, and then and then maybe like have a controlling overall controlling function that kind of just keeps track of 
how many times you've retried and then might throw an error if it, you've run out of attempts or something. Um, other approaches to this sort of like implement backtracking. All right, so in that case, you undo some of the choices, uh, the tr past prior choices you made. So you undo the propagation and you undo that choice and you take a step back and you try a different choice. And then you propagate that out and hopefully you don't reach a, a propagate, uh, a uh, contradiction again. A little bit more expensive in terms of generation, right? But uh, you get, while it's fairly rare to get a contradiction, pro perhaps, uh, I guess we'll see in practice, um, you're more likely to get a successful outcome with backtrack. So the give up and start again approach or backtracking. Maybe others. Don't know. Um, so that's that's pretty much it there, you know? Um, we're going to start, though, I think, with defining what a cell is and kind of defining the data structures, the types here. So let's define the cell. Uh, the cell has possible values. Possible patterns. Possibilities. Now that could be. Uh, this is going to be like a. We're only going to talk during while we're doing the algorithm. We're going to only talk about the tile into the pattern index indexes. Um, so this could be this could be a list of booleans, and this list would have to have the same indices. The index of each element in this list would correspond to the tile or the pattern index. Um, lists are super inefficient, though. Um, but they're good because we can. Uh, we can cause on it. Uh, we're going to be mainly eliminating from this. Uh, no, it's going to be a fixed size, really, actually. It's going to be true or false. So it could be an array. It's just a flat array. Of uh, Booleans. Right. So for our in index map, we have like 10 patterns. So this will be an array of length 10. And we can initialize all of those to true. So let's create a little uh, initialize function, um, Excel. It's going to be a cell. Uh, it's going to be, it's going to take, we have to initialize the size of the array. We're going to need maybe an integer. And uh, so, that's about it. We know we're going to initialize the Boolean value too, so. So it's going to be cell. All right, uh, list array. Uh, uh, size. Or not clear from reading the code that what size means here. It's really supposed to be the maximum index, I guess, of the tile indices or the pattern indices, which is just an int. I'll call this max index. And this should be max index. And then we need the list. And that's going to be uh, 
false or const value or uh, from zero up to max index. Is the bounds are here. <laughs> right, we don't have to do that in the list. We have to do that here, so. And this could just be uh, repeat false. And if we want to make a cell of uh, series so of 10, Pattern indices. Well, we have to derive show for that, of course. Reload that. Mm -hmm. No, it's not going to. I don't like that necessarily. could just give us the list of pattern A's. We'll actually ignore the A's and just take the indices of that. Uh, and we'll just take the length patterns. Which seems, mm. yeah, seems basic. Let's just do int there. Mm. Yeah, you know what? Max pattern index. I'm gonna go with that. I think that, that'll probably make sense. Like, if I do make cell 10, that means I've got 10 patterns. Well, no, the length of the patterns wouldn't be the max pattern index, right? It would be nine is what we're looking for if we had a length of, list of patterns of length 10. So we'd have to get get that from something. Do, 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 do. Maybe we could have a function for it. It's the output of this function here. We get this list, and that's kind of what we compute a lot of the other stuff from. Like frequency hints takes that list pattern A, and I think the color map as well. Uh, adjacency rules does as well, and the color map generation stuff does as well. Yeah. So we could wrap that up in a new type to make it a little bit more clear what it's doing. Or we could, and we could put some functions in. Like if we change this, because that way, I just want to make it clear that when you're making a cell, what index to get to pass in here. Maybe this will be kind of like an internal thing. Maybe, I don't know. But we have no real way of getting the pattern index numbers out. We just use pattern index uh, as a type alias in the color map. 
as an argument for an internal function in the adjacency rules uh, in allowed. So, in all these kind of other places. But it's not clear where that's coming from. So why don't we try that approach? New type, uh, pattern, resolve, patterns, extra patterns. Pattern result? I don't know, something like that maybe. Pub A. Yeah, actually, let's make it a structure. Patterns. That can be our list of patterns of A. And then we can have pattern. Um, max index. kind of pre-computed. And just on those there. All right, so then we already have a function pattern max index from our pattern result to get that. Um, to pass in to make cell. All right, so we can even pass that in instead. Here. And then we don't need necessarily max index here. Use record, overloaded records to destructure that pattern result structure. And pattern result max index. There needs to be a value here. Let's pull this over to the left. And what did I call it? Pattern max index. Oops. I don't want to call it this all max index, just be consistent. And there we go. Bueno. Super. Wonderful. Okay, so we pull that in like that. Let me go Excel and our pattern results, whatever. We're going to use this marker structure, but if I have the pattern results saying 9 is my max index then we will get the correct style generated based off of that. Okay, so to get a pattern result, you have to, you can get it from patterns. Uh, pattern result of A. And all we have to do is pattern result here. Uh, no, we're going to need to let bind this. Patterns. And put the constructor here. So we're going to take patterns, and then we're just going to compute the length of patterns minus one. here oh, 
Uh, I'll just call it keys. That's good. That's better. Okay, so now that we can extract that from patterns, we get the pattern result out. Um, we could use pattern result with all the other pre-gen stuff if we wanted to. here, the adding the pattern elements to color map. Yeah, this, this is all still okay. Although we could just, we might as well just go ahead and, and use it. Although this is, this is really nice. Mm. I don't think we'll be exporting these necessarily in our public API in the end anyway. So let's just leave those because it's just kind of nice having it there that way. Because um, we can still get the patterns out from the pattern result to pass into these functions. So and that might be fine. Okay. So making cell. Now we, can, now we know we can get that pattern result. Max index just fine. On the pattern result, we don't have to do any quirky calculations and making sure that the user inputs the right number and all that sort of stuff. I like that. That's better. It's kind of API I like to work with. Okay, so now that we have a cell with all the cell possibilities, uh, we need to make our output uh, grid. That's going to be like our wave. The thing that has all of the cells with all of the, where initially all of the cells have all the possible patterns. Um, that grid is gonna be of a fixed size where it's gonna be a bunch of cells. It's this. All right, and the cells are gonna be arrays of bools, maybe some extra data in them. But for now, just arrays of bools. So it's almost going to be an array of arrays. That, but this, the grid size isn't going to change. Neither is the array size. So I, th I think this should be this should be fine to be an array as well. But well, we're going to create a type for it. Um, we we'll kind of call it gridded. Do we need anything else on that? Uh, no, maybe not. Our function gets cells. It's going to be an array 
Uh, it's going to be two dimensions. This would be an array tuple and int. And. Uh, cell. As always, we'll just derive a couple of basic classes that we like to derive, make things easy to debug and use. Good. Okay, so we got the grid. And now we need to instantiate the grid with the size that we want. I don't think the output has to be square. Don't quote me on that, but I'm pretty sure it doesn't. Pretty sure we could have a wide rectangle if we wanted to. I think most of these are squarish. But yeah, I think I think we could generate. So if we can give uh, independent dimensions for the length and width, or <laughs> width and height, maybe. Yeah. Let's do that. Uh, I'm using int here and int here. I know. Negative int, negative sizes don't make sense. I know, I know. I'm going back on some things, maybe. I don't know. Let's just roll with it for now, though. Okay. Because normally, up here, say, in pattern, right? Pattern size is a word. Word is ju is pretty much an unsigned integer in Haskell. I and the reason for that is so that we can just completely ignore negative values. We don't have to consider them. But the reason why I'm a little bit mm, on it is because as we've been developing this and working on this, we have quite a bit of coercing to do to enum from e from integral to go between things that require integers and other things and then going from integers back to the word all right what even is to enum of negative one Exception. Uh, bad. Oh, bad argument. Um, enum a. Right. So uh, we're gonna have to set type applications. So you get a, an ex a runtime exception, which is no good. Right, so you always want one, our positive numbers for that. And really, pattern size should be a positive integer. It's true. Negative ones don't make sense, but are we going to export pattern in our algorithm to our, like to our users of this library? That I'm not so sure. So if we don't, right, we can validate our numbers against the, the we could take just plain old integers um, and validate that they're integers and that there's a right numbers in our in our, our like public api that gets kind of messy too though you know so what do you return for the failure case so i don't know i'm kind of wishy-washy on it maybe this should be words because the idea i was going for at least when i started to use doing this was like 
let's try using let's try this idea of using types that you know prevent the caller from giving us bad data let's try and keep going with that for now and just we'll do a retrospective maybe on it later my midpoint retrospective is mm, maybe we could just use integer and and just throw an error somewhere if you give us bad arguments Okay, so making grid, uh, we have the width and the height. Uh, list array. And we have to get the bounds here, so we're going to go from 0, 0. Uh, up to... I think including width and height, if I'm not mistaken. And then we're going to give um, oh, we need the pattern result as well. Yeah, we're gonna need the pattern result of not so in order to make all the cells. And then we gotta wrap that up in our grid. Structure. And of course, this is what I'm talking about here. Yeah, yeah. Okie dokie. Oh, actually, Muxile should be true. Be true. In the beginning, all possibilities are possible. All patterns may be represented in any given cell. as possible values for, for the cell. And as the algorithm proceeds, we'll eliminate possibilities. Salts. Okay, speaking of which, we should probably have functions for that work on those cells. Um, collapsing one and uh, eliminating would be the other ones. And then we also need an entropy function for choosing cells. So, and we also need to know uh, if a cell is collapsed or not. Okay. 
Okay, while well, they're on collapsed cells. So that means we need to know if the cell is collapsed. So what does it mean for a cell to be collapsed? It means we've picked one pattern to be the value for that cell. All right, so as you update the grid and we propagate things out, we're gonna be picking one to collapse. Right, and if we want to know if the cell is collapsed, uh, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me. There's only one true value in the array. Or we could set a value in the cell. Actually, it may be uh, pattern index. Or maybe to make this more clear. Right. So we have the array of all possible cell possibilities. And then this function becomes trivial for collapsed. Uh, for some cell. If the cell dot cell it is just cell cell collapsed. That is true. Otherwise, it is false. I think in this case, I'm actually just going to use the field names here. Okay, yeah. There we go. All right. Yeah, so we start off with all possibilities. The cell's not collapsed. Now... If we want to collapse a cell, we need a way to pick one. We basically are supposed to like, kind of just choose a value. Um, so we need some kind of randomness. 
in order to do that. Actually, we should probably checkpoint here. Uh, create commit. Mirror, mirror. Add cells and grid. doing collapsing just yet. And the other function we need on cells after collapsed, we know how to get uncollapsed cells, is this step here, on line 213, we need to choose a cell with the lowest entropy. So we need an entropy function for calculating the entropy of a cell. This is kind of a keystone part of the algorithm as I understand it. And we should probably go to grid bugs just to get a hint as to why that is. Um, this is also explained in the main wave function collapse algorithm as well, um, but it goes into some pretty good details here. Way more detail, I think, than the uh, I mean, uh, GitHub repo for, for wave function collapse. Any hoozle. Uh, there's, there's a lot of math. It's it's some math. Um, however, it's, it's not too bad. We're just talking about probability distributions here. The reason why we want to calculate this stuff and figure it out and do this mathy thing is so that Um, we can pick a cell to collapse that is going to have the highest likelihood of being adjacent to our input tile, I believe, I think. Maybe I'm wrong on this one. You don't want to choose completely randomly, which is, uh, I guess, if we were to like choose completely randomly, right, of all the possible cells that we could pick, we just pick one and collapse it. Um, ah, there it is. Yeah, there's, there's the line. The intuition behind this is to lock in one of the cells with the least uncertainty. Yeah, that, that's, that's kind of right. So, that means, like, when we pick the next cell we want to collapse, it is going to have the highest likelihood of being adjacent or being overlapping with the pattern we just picked. Does that make sense? So if you can imagine, like, the stacks and all the cells are all, like, stacks of all the patterns that we have. So each cell is, say, 10, 10 patterns we have, right? So each cell initially has 10, right? And we collapse one, we pick one. Right. Now all the neighboring stacks are still 10 high, but we're going to do the propagate step now, which means we're going to use our adjacency rules to eliminate all the patterns that can't be in the possibilities of the adjacent cells. Right. And so we might get a stack of like five and like a stack of three in one corner, a stack of two in the south so on and so forth from this this uh, grid. It kind of like creates a little divot in our hypothetical imaginary table, right? And if we were to just choose randomly the next cell to collapse, 
Um, from so even even from the neighbors, right? Um, we would get like a very noisy output, and probably a very high probability that our wave won't collapse all the way, and we'd have to like retry a lot. Um, so instead, by choosing entropy, we're we're picking the small, basically the smallest stack of the one of the of the ones that are still on the table. So like maybe the one that just has three in it. All right. Now there's the possibility you can run in the in into the where like you have a stack of three and a stack of three, and which one has the lowest entropy? Well, you could just choose randomly between those as well. Those that would be fine, but um, because it amounts kind of the same thing. They both have relatively the same amount of uncertainty as uh, this intuition says. Um, so yeah, that that's kind of the gist of it. Um, this gives you the, a more formal introduction on how to calculate this. It looks kind of scary. It's not that bad. Okay. P of X, that's just a function. We use those in Haskell all the time. All right. Um, we have an unknown value with N possibilities, right? That's our pattern. Right. And this N X1, X2 to Xn is our stack of patterns. The probability of a given value, a given pattern, represented as a number between zero and one is expressed as this function. Okay. So whatever it doesn't matter it doesn't matter a whole lot what this function is. But it's gonna return a value between zero and one. And then the entropy of your unknown value is this formula here. Okay, so we're just gonna subtract together a bunch of multiplications from each other. Okay. So this log function here is they say is arbitrary. Well, you can use whatever log you want. Um, and this is y. So calculating all of that out using computer code can be simplified. Um, well, they're doing just some transformations here, I guess, on the formula. Yeah, and then we got an implementation here. So relative tile frequency. So the simplified entropy definition is relevant to choosing the next cell as a frequency hint. That's what we generated in the pre, um, pre-processing steps is effectively a discrete probability distribution of possible choices of the tile. So that's like how often that particular tile shows up in the tiles and all the tile sets, like the whole thing. Um, so that frequency is like the number of times it shows up. It's discrete. It's like a one value. So a sort of tile pattern, you know. So we already have this, I think, in the map, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and then we need a function. Well, they use a function here to add up the relative frequencies of all possible tiles. This corresponds to the total weight in the simplified entropy equation. All right. Okay. So total possible tile frequencies, we're gonna, let's do that then. Total possible tile frequency. Are we going to take our tile frequency map? A uh, cell, probably a cell. And returns. 
or you size. Uh, I think that's an integer. Summing uh, from this relative frequency function, which also returns a user in the tile index. So I think that's just reaching into the tile in the top frequency map there, taking out a number and adding it. Summing. That's what it does, right? So some integer. Oh yeah, I got my uh, error messages showing up again in Emacs. I just had to update a bunch of packages. I was just being lazy and hadn't done that in a while. Uh, tile frequency, I didn't call it that. I call it like frequency map or something. Did I not create a type for that at all? Let's see. What did I do? You can see. Oh, I just returned a map and didn't. Let's go and create a new type for that. Frequency hints. Uh, and that's going to be the frequency hints. And that's going to be our map into int. And we'll add our usual box there. Really, that's not going to be it. That's going to be a uh, pattern index, which is int, but just for readability's sake. And then uh, we can uh, have a little function there for getting things out of the frequency hints for a tile index, right? Just index it to a simple indexing function. Let's call it uh, frequency. Pattern next to int. Well, and we're going to have to give the frequency hints as well. We'll give it in this position. Frequency. Frequency hints. And then we just have to. Uh, well, because it's a map, it might return an int. If that pattern index is in there. In this case, it'll just be. Uh, look up X. okay and da -da -da -da. this can return that now and da -da -da -da. we just wrap up our function here in our constructor goes let's get our builder going to the tests just because i usually start the stream that way but hey well, okay and let's see how did i call it tile frequencies did i just spend all that time saying tile frequencies frequency hints frequency hints, frequency hints. okay There we go. Okay, so 
so for this particular tile, we need to, with the hints, get the total times. Oh, the cells possible patterns. The cells possible patterns. Uh, if that cell is possible, then we c we add it to the total. Okay. We add its relative frequency. Okay. Good, good, good. So I'm going to call frequency. Call that relative frequency. I could have done that faster, but burp. got multiple things going on at once up here. Okay, let's jump back down here. So. Frequency hints. Okay. So we're going to fold. Function, start with zero, over uh, cell possibilities. And this function has to be int bool int. some possible cell. Okay, so some possible cell, that's our count, our accumulator. Total. And if it's true, do something. Uh, if it's false, uh, we just have to return total. We just ignore, ignore everything. So what do we? What can we do in the true case here? Well. We have to get a number somewhere to add to total. Return an int. Uh, that thing we're going to get, though, is going to be from frequency hints. So what we actually need in cell possibilities is the association list, I think. I'm gonna change the type of some possible cell a little bit. This will be pattern indexed. And in the false case, we don't care about it. And there's our other number that we need. Uh, total shadows, oh. Okay, so our total possible tile frequency. 
Let's see. Uh, yeah, I think that's about right. And then we can do the sums. We have the total weight from total possible tile frequency for that cell. And then we sum uh, of weight log weight. So I think this is where we add up all of those um, terms, or at least in the simplified version. Beep, beep. Those ones. Yeah, so there's the terms. Times log two or zero and then sum them together. And then return the total weight minus those divided by the total weight. Which is which lines up to that. Corresponds to that. That's that's pretty good. I like that. Nice and straightforward. Okay. And so we call this entropy. This is the entropy function. This is the main one. We take a cell. Uh, we need the frequency hints. And we're going to turn a float. A double. Maybe a float. Maybe a double. Yeah, so we get the cell, we get the frequency hints. Let's go. Like that. Boom. We're going to start off with a let binding of the of total weight, which is the total possible tile frequency for that cell. Given the frequency hints we have. And uh, we also need the sum of weight log weight. And uh, then we're just going to go through the possibilities for this cell. Mapping it to some floats. And we're going to sum them together. We're going to take the array association list of uh, the cell possibilities. So this hole here is the main kind of function. Uh, we'll call it to um, to log to log weight. Makes sense. Where to log weight is going to be a list of pattern indexes. Um, with their values. And 
Can we return float? We need to add a map in there. What's the problem here? Do -do -do. That's this one. Uh, bool with int. Oh, sorry, my bad. There we go. All right, cool. Six is possible. I got so in the case it's true, it's possible. Uh, it's false. And that's kind of the split we want. In the case where it's true, uh, we know we can do this formula here. We take the relative frequency for that tile. That we're mapping over and we multiply it with its log two. So we get its relative frequency. Relative frequency of this tile index in our frequency hints. And we RF times two of RF. I don't know what our log two function actually is in that spot. We have one. Well, let's check. Is there one in base? There's one of kryptonite math functions. Is it called something else? That wouldn't be called that. Weird. Uh, let's Google. Called log base. That might be our one. Okay, log base. Although, how do we get the log base of our floats? Eh, no, we could just do 2.0. Yeah. Log base. because relative frequency might not be in there. Hmm. Well, now we have a design decision to make. Because relative frequency, because the frequency hints is ultimately a map underneath, it means that if we try to look up an index in it, a pattern index, even though at this point when we're calling entropy, we kind of sort of already know that it's going to be in there. Um, but Haskell doesn't let us kind of like take shortcuts like that. So we'd have to blow up or return a value. Okay. This code imp 
function re always returns an F32, even though we get a reference to these frequency hits. And relative frequency also returns a size. So I guess they could get around this by returning zero if it's missing. Which would be kind of the same as saying it's not in there. And so this would return zero and be the same as the empty case. Yeah, that's probably the better way of doing things. Let's go with it. Relative frequency. Let's go off of maybe int. We'll do uh, maybe zero. Or IB. Cool. And now this is the problem of this is. Uh, couldn't manage to expect to type float with actual type int. Okay, so our relative frequency we have to explicitly cast up to double our float from our integer relative frequency. Uh, take that call that takes care of that. And then, so this empty case here, they just turn zero. Okay, so then we have one little hole to fill in. We got the sum of weight log weight. And then we can do our final uh, total weight minus this. We take uh, log base. I don't Turn that into a helper function, but I'm just going to write it out this way for now. 2.0 total weight minus the sum of weight log weight divided by total weight. Wants a flute? Yes, it does. Not a problem. Specs are broken because we changed a couple of types. Yeah, we'll fix those up. Uh, but this is looking good. Okay, so we've got our entropy calculation. Okay, I'm kind of just looking at the implementation for that because, you know, it's a bunch of stuff. Uh, but of course, this is going to, like, calculate a bunch of stuff. So caching... Because we're going to be recalculating entropy as we go along in our algorithm, right? Um, when we choose a cell with the lowest entropy, we collapse it. And then we propagate. And so when we propagate that choice out, right, we change the amount of cards in the stack, to use my previous metaphor, or visualization. Visual metaphor. Visual for. Anyways, uh, we, we, we collapse out that stack, and so that cell's state has changed, and therefore the entropy of that cell has changed. 
And so we need to recalculate that entropy. As you can imagine. Uh, recalculating all of this for every single cell on all those propagations gonna get expensive and um, there are it turns out based on this blog post um, there are parts of it that don't change a whole lot and so we can cache those parts all right, so it can be made cost of time with caching. Throughout the course of this algorithm, possible tiles will be removed from cells. The only time a cell's entropy changes is when a possible tile is actually removed. All right, so the caching strategy will be able to keep a running total of the possible, the sum of the possible tiles, so that weight. And the sum of weight log weight parts. All right. So this caching strategy will basically compute those, these values, I guess, in our entropy calculation and stash those in the cell. And in the cell data. And that way we just compute it when the cell's state changes. Saving us a lot of work, which I think is pretty smart. Okay, so let's implement the caching and then uh, we'll go back and get the test working again. Just kind of clean up what we've done and then we'll see where we're at from there. Um, so I'm going to go ahead, since this actually works and compiles, works, but we haven't written any, any proofs that it works, but <laughs> or any kind of examples to at least demonstrate and convince ourselves that it works, but I'm gonna say it works. I'm just gonna commit that there. Maybe we will we will write some tests for it just to make sure we know we have a good sense of these things. Okay. And uh, entropy. Okay, and what's that caching? So we go cell total weight. Uh, okay, don't know what that should be there yet. And uh, cell uh, sum of weight log weight. Like that. Also a float. And there we go there. Did I spell it right? Oh, I, I called it sum here. Yeah, <laughs> of course. It's, I'm looking at the wrong part of the word. Because uh, I called it sum of weight log weight down there. What's we're going to do? Some. Okay. Okay, so we've got to put something in here for the holes. Sum of. So I guess we're going to calculate these out and that out as well. We could rip these into functions. Yeah, I think so. I uh, will put them right here. 
here. Alright, that's gonna be cell total weight. What is it gonna take an input? The frequency hints. A cell. And return to float. Hmm. Maybe a little bit awkward using our initializer. No, 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 it'll be fine. We won't be able to do it there, but there's a way to do it. Um, so yeah, let's just finish this here. Cell hints. And we'll just pull this up here. And put it here. And then we can sell total weight. Sell and hints. And the problem with this is multiple descriptions. Oh, I named this. Yeah, what's called total weight then? Hmm. Internally here. Call this one eat the way you take those two and call them to them as well. I should take care of that. Yep. Okay. And we'll move some of weight log weight. That all what does that need? It needs two log weight, it needs the cell and the weight log weight needs the frequency hits. So, cell, frequency hits. Weight log weight hence and pop that bad boy there. Put that there. That there. That there. Put it here. Let's just clean this up a little bit. Okay, down. All right, and then so up here, we can initialize this with. But we're gonna need the frequency hints in order to construct the cell. for their their uh, what I was gonna do is like initialize that to zero but then I have to pass in the frequency hints in order to construct the core the cell um, so I'm just looking how they took a similar tack as well
Okay, the initialize over here. Cell template, core cell. Possible vector. Let me sum it up right there. I'm going to take the function there, which means they have the frequency hints and scope when they call this up there, yeah. So we would have to pass it into our make cell here. We have the pattern result we can actually calculate the frequency map but we don't actually want to calculate the frequency map when we call make cell Ooh. i'm gonna uh, make cell is probably gonna be an internal implementation detail so i'll make it a pat a, a uh, parameter frequency hints here We initialize it to zero, we let bind the initial cell. We do it that way, or... So, basically we would take cell and then we would apply C such that cell total weight equals total weight B with hints and cell sum of weight log weight is total uh, sum of weight log. All right, we could do it like that. Or, if we just take the cell possibilities as an argument, because that's all we're really using cell for in some of like log weight and, well, total possible tile frequency. Well, it's also using that. Uh, basically, if we remove the cell requirement, then we can just pop those in the arguments here in the constructor, and we don't have to do this left binding with this. So we just pass in all possibilities. Hmm. Let's try that. I'm going to stage this. Add cache cell weights. And let's just try to refactor that out. Being that way. See if that works. So instead of this, uh, all possibilities is going to be a array a pattern index to boolean a pattern index to boolean this thing Call possibilities and then we just pop possibilities here. And everything else is the same. Total weight. Ray, pattern index, bool here. Possibilities. I'm using the same word for the argument, so I might as well probably make a type wrapper for it, perhaps. Um, Possibilities and uh, 
some of weight locker. Okay, and a couple of type errors. Yeah, yep, yeah, okay. So I should be able to get rid of that. Go back to here. And then we can do full weight all possibilities. Uh, we still need to pass the hints in, and then the sum of weight log weight, all possibilities, and hints. Okay, and now, oh, we got to clean up entropy now. Which is fine. Right, the simplified version of it now can just um, da -da -da. That's the root, uh, uh, enter B yeah. so then we can just simplify the expression down here right, so we can get the the TW and some of like weight log weight out of the cell um, we don't use cell anywhere else for that. Yeah, I think we can just pull it out with the record overloaded records. Make grid just has to be updated here because uh, we pass in the uh, histogram to it or the frequency hints. Uh, we could calculate that up here in the pattern result. Yeah, and to calculate the frequency hints, we have to use the yeah, frequency hints function, uh, the list of pattern A's. So we get the pattern result. Patterns. Pattern result patterns. Yes, so that's the one. Word E. It's probably demanded by frequency hints. Okay. Then entropy just needs the cell. Yeah, it doesn't need the hints anymore. Oh, 
Okay. Next here. Okay. Now uh, you're back to. Yeah. Okay. Cool. All right. Uh, what else? Yeah, that's a funk that much just means. using hints in total possible tile frequency here uh which would which is kind of a hint that we're either we don't actually need it we should remove it or we didn't implement this properly Total possible tile frequency We have to look up the relative frequency for a given tile index if it's possible to add it to the sum. Which we get from. They're looking it up in the frequency hints. Uh, for the tile index in the possible tiles. Okay, yeah, so I think we do have to use it. Uh, we don't add the X here. This is the X we want to look up in that hints map. So, um, relative frequency, X and hints. There we go. those in the test suite but otherwise we're good sweet okay so now we just need to add the um, a couple more cell functions for removing a cell from the set of possibilities or removing a pattern from the set of possibilities which will have to update our cached entropy calculations and all that stuff. And all that. So let me, we have a to-do file here. So I remember this for next week. Go. Let's start one. Uh, so we need to remove possibility. Uh, tile index or pattern index from the cell possibilities and update cached entropy values. Cool. All right, let's check this in. values Remember that. okay and we'll quickly fix the spec and i think we're running low on time for the rest of the stream so we'll just go quickly fix the spec and then i think we'll call it there so we'll go to the, the test pod directory go to spec and our failing ones Frequency hints test, no problem. It's just gonna be some unwrapping, I think.
All right, so generate frequency hands, it returns a frequency hand. So this should just be composed with another function here uh, to get those out from the new pipe wrapper. Which we called, yeah, frequency hints. I should leave just the one, I think. Ah, pattern result. We want a pattern result of frequency hints, not a list of patterns. And so that'll be pattern result patterns. And then uh, one more test to fix. Oh, 15. Yeah, so length of patterns. Just want to compose that with pattern result patterns. Cool, we're back to good. Okay, cool. So let's take a look at our work so far. Kind of sells a grid, entropy functions. Uh, we could probably make sense to squish this down. Maybe it might make sense to squish this down to one big commit. Let's see. Kind of results, sub patterns. Make cell, make cell collapsed and grid. And then we added entropy stuff, cache cell weights and the values, and then we fixed the tests. Um, the test fixes are because of changes to pattern results and frequency hints. Uh, yeah, so that test one kind of depends on these two. This one and this one. Yeah, so I don't think there's a way we can order these to structure in two. I'll just, oh yeah, I'll just squish down the one. Ba, ba, ba. Word that. Good. Right, uh, grid is initialized with all the patterns extracted from uh, reprocessing. It contains cells that have all the possible Pattern indexes at first. Also added the entropy function for determining which cell to collapse next in the algorithm. Super duper. I'm going to just get rid of that. Blah, blah, blah. That's good. All right, pushing that up. So if this is your first time tuning in and you like what you saw, thanks for watching. It was nice having you. I'm always open to questions and diversions, by the way. So backseat programming is all fine. Or if you want to talk about your projects or anything you get stuck on, also fine too. I do these streams about once, I do these streams basically once a week on Tuesday evenings, 10 after eight in the evening or so in the Eastern Standard Time Zone. So if you want to just write that down somewhere and follow it, set yourself a reminder all good 
Uh, if you want to get notifications from Twitch, then just give us a follow and set up your notifications and you'll get notified when I go online. Uh, which does happen sometimes outside of my normal schedule once in a while. So you'll get those. If you are just following my video on demands on my YouTube channel, um, then you know what to do there. You can subscribe and like. It helps everything out, gets more visibility for, for the stream, for Haskell in general, um, and things like that. So, you can also follow me on the Fediverse. I'm on the Typestop PL server in uh, Mastodon there. So, give us a follow there. My profile also has all of the links to all my stuff. So, like, my Twitch stream, my YouTube channel, my website as well. And what else? We also have a Discord server and a Discord channel on a Discord server, actually. So, if you go to the link above my head, that's uh, declarative.tv. There's... It's a cool little website. It's got a link to a Discord server there. There's a channel for this stream. So if you didn't get to ask any of the questions you wanted to ask on stream, or again, you're in a different time zone and you're following along, then give us a chat there and ask questions there and talk about your stuff there. Um, and uh, that's that's pretty much all I got. So thanks for tuning in again. It was, it's been wonderful. And I'll see you next week. May your monads always be free and your types always check. And have a great time hacking out there. Take it easy.